a special session on drug repositioning and polypharmacology. So my name is uh, Michael Schroeder from Technical University of uh, Dresden and together with Phil Bone from San Diego and Jakob Köhler from Dow AgroSciences, we've been organizing this special session for the, for the second time. And uh, last time in Long Beach, it was really a massive success. We had about 200 people crowded in a tiny room and that's why it was so great that they gave us the whole one for today and uh, it's nice to see there are many people it's not quite 200 yet but maybe more are are, are coming and it's good to all see you uh, there but we haven't filled the 3000 yet completely but uh, let's wait for the rest of the of the rest of the talks uh, we will have three talks that uh, cover a diversity of, of aspects in drug repositioning and in particular it was always our idea in this session to um, also see the industrial angle on drug repositioning. Because at the end of the day, uh, drug repositioning is a very practical um, field where really all kinds of techniques from gene expression analyses to protein interactions to text mining to image analysis and so on can be applied to the purpose of uh, giving a new purpose to, um, to a drug. And that's of course ultimately where also it becomes interesting to, to real life and, and industry. And that's why it's particularly nice that we have also Philippe Sanson from GlaxoSmithKline give a talk. And for the panel discussion in the fourth slot, we also have some more people from, from industry where we want to spark a little bit uh, the discussion on which direction this field is, is, is taking, how realistic things are, how successful different, different approaches are. So without further Ado, let's come to our first speaker. <clears throat> Phil Bourne kindly agreed to uh, step in when we had a cancellation to give this uh, um, presentation on his work together with um, Lei Ji, who is now at uh, New York City University on basically their common work that they've done in the past on specific applications of drug repositioning. So thanks a lot to Phil and over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's nice to be speaking into a vacuum, I have to say. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, but actually, Lay just gave me these slides yesterday. It's, uh, and so I, I, if I put it into full screen mode, I can't actually read the slide. There's no way I can make this presentation without actually being able to read the slides. I should say that uh, I'm, I'm just going to try and update you on uh, a little work uh, that we've been doing uh, on a long-standing project. Some of you have seen these, uh, these uh, network graphs of, of interactions between authors that you can pull out of PubMed. Uh, Robert Priestner here in Charité in Berlin has produced some nice ones for a whole group of us during this meeting. And essentially, in the nodes of the people you've collaborated with on papers and the edges, the thickness of the edges are how many times you publish with them. And my thickest edge in that network is, in fact, Lei Ji. Uh, he deserves uh, certainly all of the credit for this. I, uh, what are the pieces I'm going to tell you today. Um, and he's now, uh, I'm pleased to say, well, pleased and sorry to say, an associate professor at CUNY City University of New York, and he's doing very well. So I'm going to essentially update you on our own pipeline uh, for, uh, I guess, a number of aspects of what we would call systems pharmacology uh, with uh, a, a new piece of work that's uh, come out recently that's not yet published. And then how we've applied this uh, in two areas, one of which is published and one is yet to be published, that relates to infectious diseases. So uh, just a, I'm sorry I'm doing it this way, but I just can't read it otherwise. Um, so the, the, with infectious diseases, uh, what's absolutely clear is uh, that the, the antibiotics, there's just, uh, it's quite interesting to look, and this is taken from nature chemical biology that the uh, resistance, how long it takes to build resistance. It's perhaps less so in Europe but certainly in the US very controversial about uh, how much um, treatment is given with antibiotics and you can see with things like uh, vancomycin it's been a long time before resistance is built but some of the more recent uh, antibiotics, um, in fact, shown here on the, I can't do it with this I guess, um, in fact, resistance has been observed, uh, strains of resistance has been res observed very quickly indeed. So at the same time, we're, we're experiencing 25% of world deaths come from these kinds of diseases. Um, so it, it's, 
it's, it's a problem to the point where, uh, in fact, some bacteria actually use antibiotics as nourishment, which is a bit scary. So that's one sort of motivation for why we work in this area. Um, the other, of course, is the, just the absolute time it takes to uh, bring anything uh, through the drug discovery pipeline. And in fact, um, these are just sort of two pipelines, again taken from uh, other people's Excuse work. Me. Excuse me, can you switch to fu uh, full screen, please? Well, the problem is I can't read my slides when I do that. If someone can tell me on a map how to see the full slide, I'd be happy to do that. What I'm, seeing, what I'm seeing right now is exactly this. How do I get out of that so I can see the full? Does anybody know? This is a test. Ford, who does back? Yeah, sorry, I, I apologize, but it's the best I can do. Um, so just the time involved in doing this, of course, if you repurpose, uh, it obviously has a lot of advantages in the fact that it's been through the FDA process and so on. And certain aspects of the process, uh, particularly the development, uh, in fact, go much faster. And I should say that I just want to make this point because I'm now uh, involved in this myself. Uh, where I am at the University of California, uh, San Diego, I'm now uh, involved. I'm actually the Associate Vice Chancellor of Innovation. And my job, part of my job now, is actually to get things out of the door and into the private sector where they have societal benefit. And I have to say to you that everything that we talk about here is such preliminary uh, relative to the whole process of taking something from the, the bench or in silico in the computer uh, in, into, uh, into a drug. So, you know, I think we need to be conscious of that and really trying as much as we can to help the process uh, along um, in, in, in whatever ways that we can. So, because even, you know, even with repurposing, uh, the, the time frame is the order of six, could be at least six years, but it's definitely uh, an improvement. And of course, it's very attractive to drug companies in the sense that, um, or people who can pick up drugs that are off patent because they've, uh, it's, it's actually a very relatively cheap way uh, to have an impact. So the, the, the challenges in all of this, if you're looking at against uh, challenges for drug repurposing against infectious diseases, is you know, there are these series of different approaches, phenotype-based uh, methods, for example, looking at gene expression profiles, but it's difficult to compare these. There are unknown targets uh, for bioactive compounds. It's, it's, it, it, it's still you know, in its formative stages. Ligand-based uh, cheminformatics methods, you've got limited target coverage, particularly of pathogen genomes, um, and so it becomes rather difficult. And then uh, if you go to target-based uh, uh, modeling methods, uh, clearly uh, these don't scale to genome levels when you need to do molecular dynamic simulation and so forth. So we need sort of new approaches for this. So, um, this is our particular pipeline for doing this, and this has been, most of this has been around for quite a while. Uh, the bits that I'm, uh, are new are this gene SAR, which I'm going to tell you about today, um, a little, and uh, the other parts of the pipeline. So where you see these clapping hands, this is new stuff. Uh, the, uh, the rest is, uh, is already in place. And in fact, if you were at Carol Goebel's talk uh, prior to this, where she talked about work, workflows of reproducibility, we've actually been experimenting with putting all of this into workflows and measuring, in fact, the increase in productivity we get by doing that. It's a bit of an aside, but uh, this is all available for download um, and, and, re and use. So if you're interested in that, you can just Google it and find it. Um, so let me just quickly go through the whole process here of, of how we operate. So I'll explain GeneSAR in a minute, but it's essentially how we go from a chemical entity uh, into identifying a target. Once we have a target, uh, what we want to know is what other targets are out there that uh, this particular chemical entity might, in fact, bind to. We have this uh, software called SMAP for doing that, which is essentially a, a functional site, a ligand binding site comparison approach that's been around for about four or five years. It was talked about quite a bit in 3D SIG the other day. Then we, we come up with a series of, uh, of 
of, off, uh, of potential uh, off targets, which could actually be other experimental structures or models. Um, we then, uh, in a subset of those, uh, well, for those we do ligand, uh, we actually validate that in fact this particular query chemical does in fact bind to that target. Um, and then for the most promising cases, uh, we actually look at this uh, from a dynamical point of view. So uh, by docking into various uh, components of the trajectory for each of these receptors, uh, you know, using my molecular dynamic simulation, we then feed this into uh, network models and uh, we generate hypotheses for uh, what, what, what this might mean uh, biologically. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of those hypotheses, and I emphasize it's hypotheses uh, until, of course, it's ex tested experimentally, and that's something that we're absolutely insistent on as well. And in fact, we've been doing this in the context of, uh, let me just try and do this in an animation at least, um, trying to do this with, we've been doing this with, uh, actually with drug companies. Um, and in fact, that, that's actually been a, uh, an important part of our research is to actually have them, in fact, engaged in this. So the piece that's new here around this gene SAR is the idea of uh, actually uh, going beyond, for example, where existing methods like SIGO in identifying uh, similar ligands, which have then, of course, can be used to identify similar targets. And the process that we're using for this is in, in, in spirit, taken from a, the, the context of a Google-like uh, page ranking algorithm. So effectively what you have is you have a query and then you have um, some uh, results, that some matches to that query, but you also have, uh, you're not picking up everything, so you have false negatives and you have false positives. And so um, what, what we try and do is we then, by using simple, we build a chemical graph for all this based primarily around uh, Tanamoto coefficients to actually begin uh, clustering these things together. And effectively, uh, rather than just proceed, we actually, the key is, as is in the, you can imagine this in a Google-like situation, where you're actually looking at links across all of the, you're not just tracing one path through the network. You're looking at all of the interrelationships within uh, these clusters. And in fact, it turns out that this works out quite well. And so what happens is you actually get a rank ordered list of chemical entities that are similar to your query chemical entity, uh, which uh, are actually ranked pretty well. Certainly, and I'll show you a particular reference to that in a second. So let's just, so that's sort of a, a, an approach that goes into this that, that's actually fairly new, hasn't been published yet. So the basic idea is you start off with, uh, you know, a chemical database and you build a chemical graph uh, for everything uh, using fingerprints will be one, uh, you know, an initial approach uh, to, to actually create these sort of clusters of chemical entities which are associated with targets, which then of course, I, and could potentially overlap. Um, and, then, and then you actually do a random walk where, with restart through the network uh, as, as a sort of preliminary way of doing this. Uh, and so you actually find, you know, you might find connections in that network. And then uh, you get, you know, some global statistics and a score distribution out of that um, using the kind of approach that I just described. And then you get a rank ordering of the targets based on, uh, so you're actually finding targets from these chemical databases by virtue of these, um, uh, this, this, this sort of approach. And I guess this is sort of, uh, this rock curve is sort of the key element of this uh, gene SAR approach and, and in terms of uh, selectivity and sensitivity, it actually, that compared to a random walk, uh, it does, uh, C of course does much better than that. And in fact, this approach, uh, by using this Google-esque-like approach, seems to, at least uh, for this, these particular test sets, to do very well. So this is uh, a way we believe that uh, it could be uh, useful in finding more targets, right? based on uh, the relationship to the chemical entities that you start with. Then, of course, if you've got these, these targets, 
um, you then want to uh, you know, essentially extend that, that set based on uh, the chemical similarity of, uh, of the binding sites. And that's where this, this SMAP comes in. I'm not going to describe that because it's uh, actually been uh, well documented and described before. But of course, the key part of it is uh, the global structures associated, I should say these are all protein targets, although we're now working on uh, RNA and DNA-based uh, SMAP. Um, the, the, the global structures, of course, are, can be extremely different, and it's these particular binding sites that uh, are, uh, are conserved. And this is actually a profile-profile-based approach for comparing binding sites, where the profiles uh, are defined for the specific binding sites. And we find that that, it's another example, and we see many of these in these, in these meetings now, where using the power of sequences aligned to each of these global structures gives you a profile within the area of the binding site, uh, which is, is quite comparable. It doesn't necessarily say these things are related evolutionarily, although that's an interesting question, even though the global structures are different. But it is uh, an interesting point that clearly that there's some signal that you can extract out of that using profiles to find these comparisons. And I think that that is the essence of this SMAP approach. Uh, I should say that all of this at a very high level is, is, is described in, uh, in this, this URL here if you're interested. But these are just examples that we've done over the years um, that have sort of exploited this pipeline, um, particularly the SMAP component of it. And I'll just mention very briefly uh, you know, one of the particular instances relates to uh, an, uh, nelfinavir. Nelfinavir has been shown, uh, obviously, it's, it's, sorry, it's, obviously but it's a protease inhibitor. It's part of, uh, used frequently as part of uh, HIV treatment cocktail. And yet what, we've, uh, what was reported initially antidotally, and then there was a clinical trial, which is still ongoing, that, that nelfinavir has a positive effect against certain uh, types of solid tumors. And by running this kind of pipeline, what you can establish is that nelfinavir, even though it's a protease inhibitor, actually binds to um, a number of different kinases with relatively low affinity. So it's an example of uh, polypharmacology where uh, the, this particular protease inhibitor uh, has all this low affinity binding. And then you can map that to the pathways and you can uh, ultimately get close to the point of understanding why, in fact, it's having effects on these tumors. Uh, and that's been picked up on. And a number of these studies have actually been picked up on uh, by drug companies, which is, which is encouraging. So let me just, that was, that was, let me just give you a couple of uh, case studies around uh, infectious diseases. Um, so one of these, uh, this, particularly this first one, has, uh, is based on some experimental studies. And the, it, it relates to uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Yeah, which is uh, a problem uh, particularly, and this is not, I mean, we're particularly interested in things that affect the developing world, but this one, uh, in fact, uh, the reason we started working on this is because there's a very good experimental uh, animal model um, that comes from Fiona's Brinkman's group, which I'll mention in a minute. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, this is a, this is a condition that uh, is found uh, throughout the developed world, and it's probably one of the main causes of infections uh, in hospitals, um, particularly with people who uh, are, are compromised with respect to their, uh, their respiratory systems. So, you know, the, what we established through this pipeline is, I'm going to go to this mode again, I apologize. So the, we established through this pipeline this uh, PHZB2 uh, as a, a drug target, and it turns out that looking at it in the context of its networks, that uh, it's involved in phyocyanin biosynthesis, although the, the, the exact molecular function remains unknown. But phyocyanin is itself a virulent, virulence factor for these bacteria and induces oxidative stress and quorum sensing, uh, which is... Uh, a key element uh, of, the, uh, of the effect of this pathogen. Uh, there are no human uh, orthologs to this, so it's actually a very good target. What we discovered through this process that I just described to you without going into the details of, of that directly, 
is that uh, raloxifen, uh, which is a select uh, estrogen receptor modulator that's used in uh, a variety of sort of hormone treatments, including for various kinds of cancers, um, and for therapy for osteoporosis, uh, actually is a, a pretty good um, uh, uh, inhibitor. And in fact, uh, there's a C. elegans and Fiona Brinkman um, with work with uh, Sue um, has actually got an animal model where we could actually test this in C. In C. elegans. And without going into any of the details of this, um, certainly the survival rate uh, using this particular drug in the C. elegans model uh, was increased very dramatically. So this red line um, is an example of that at low concentration. At higher concentrations, this is the raloxifen drug. This is uh, a particular strain. And in fact, uh, what we observe is a much greater survival rate um, and a reduced virulence factor production of the phyocyanin. So this would seem to be strong experimental support that this is, in fact, uh, is the uh, drug-target interaction that's, uh, that's having this effect. And that's being followed up on uh, by a, a drug company. Uh, a second example is the, this, what we call the so-called malaria box, and I'll, I'll explain that to you in a second. But um, the point here is that, uh, you know, again, malaria is uh, uh, a distinct problem, mainly in the developing world, um, but uh, there are you know, uh, many deaths each year. And there's uh, anti-malarial drugs have hardly changed uh, in, in, in the last uh, 20, 30 years, and uh, not surprisingly, therefore, there's significant resistance to those drugs. So one of the things we've been doing, you're giving me the victory symbol? Oh, two minutes, oh, okay. I, 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 yeah, I, I'd be surprised to get the victory symbol for this talk. Okay, so very quickly. So um, what we've done in the past is we compute drug ohms. So we essentially, we generate large-scale hypothesis, so this is high throughput, where what we're doing is looking at all FDA-approved drug potential receptor interactions for that given proteome based on the amount that we can model. So we now have these kinds of what we call drug ohm networks. Uh, in this case for malaria, we've also, TB was published a while ago, but we also have the human network now. And we can overlay other properties onto these networks, and we can overlay the human and the pathogen network itself. So we can look, for example, for situations where we have uh, on-market drugs that have lots of connections to receptors in one of the pathogens, but not in human, and, and, and sort of uh, support that. So in this particular case, uh, what we've done is we applied that pipeline through the malaria box which is uh, essentially 400 diverse compounds that have been shown to have anti-malarial activity, 200 of which are drug-like. Uh, but the molecular targets are unknown, and so are the in vivo uh, activity, and also what particular side effects might exist. So we've run, as I'm running out of time, we've run that through this pipeline I showed you before. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, we come up, 157 of those uh, actually interact with four of those uh, those compounds um, from the malaria box actually interact with 427 targets across a variety of species. And in fact, you can then uh, essentially find an intersection using this kind of uh, approach based on these compounds in the malaria box, compounds uh, within drug bank. You can look at the intersection and you can come up with um, some essential uh, targets within uh, malaria and, and drugs that, in fact, uh, at least have promise to, uh, which of course are prescribed for completely different purposes that uh, might, in fact, be able to be repositioned. Um, and so th th this provides the targets to these particular malaria box uh, pro uh, uh, ligands, which can then be explored. So uh, in summary, we have a new, you know, an extension really, but uh, a, a chemical genomics approach based on a Google-like algorithm to identify drug target interactions by identifying uh, targets from uh, exploring uh, chemical space in a different way. Uh, and then we've applied that. That pipeline is, exists. Uh, it can be downloaded. Uh, the, the first part that I just described today is not yet available. 
but if you were that keen on trying it out, I'm sure that can be arranged. Um, the other part is downloadable and usable either as in a workflow or um, uh, as individual components. And I just want to emphasize again that doing stuff like this is really, there's such a disparity between if you interact like I do with clinicians at the bedside, between what goes on at the bedside and what we're sitting here talking about, I think we ought to all think about how we can really accelerate and reduce that gap and be involved in that process. Thank you very much. said uh, in silico is very far away from the real world uh, it's a long way and then in one of the slides you had some automated docking and then later on you did molecular dynamics to further validate that how much do you think is being lost by f taking flexibility only very late in the process into account yeah I mean I think probably quite a lot <laughs> in fact we've you know I think it we're, I'm I work quite closely with Andy McCammon's group who sort of pioneered this sort of use of uh, flexible, uh, use of molecular dynamics to look across the trajectories. And what they're doing it in specific cases. We are, in fact, by virtue of the screening process that gets us to the targets we want to look at in the first place, um, we're, we're already losing a lot. And so we're only doing molecular dynamics on a subset of the things that we should be doing molecular dynamics on. I mean, you know, we, on occasion will be reasons because there's something in the literature and we'll go back through our rank ordered list of off targets uh, because there's, there's some evidence in the literature now that something farther down the list, uh, this is all based on p-values and a, a whole uh, statistical analysis that's part of the papers associated with this work, um, that, you know, we'd missed. And, you know, so there's lots of, there are lots of things we're missing. This is by no means, you know, uh, but I think over time you begin to refine and you begin to, you know, yeah. do more. And we're, we're actually, I should say, we use the open science grid and a lot of really fabulous open compute resources which allow us to do more of, say, the dynamics on more systems than we would otherwise. Okay. So, quick question over there. Uh, a question about the, an, another real world barrier. Do you find with repurposing that they're often intellectual property related causes of attrition. So, so there are things that look very good from a model perspective, but the commercial uh, prospect is very tricky. And, and roughly how often does that occur? Yeah, that ha happens a lot. In fact, we, we, you know, there are lists of compounds that are off patent that uh, we try and actually focus on. But it's, it's a good point. And in fact, um, but you know, we've, and I have to say that, uh, I don't want to deride drug companies, but what the heck is that we, when we found cases of things that are on patent and we approach drug companies about repurposing, there's generally not, maybe it's just again for us, I mean perhaps my other colleagues here will have a better stories to tell, but in fact uh, there's not necessarily been a lot of interest. But that's often because we're, we're, we see repurposing opportunities with things like neglected tropical diseases which as a sort of generic statement uh, don't make much money. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. And um, before we come to our next speaker, a small announcement. In March next year, we will have a dedicated two-day workshop on drug repositioning in Dresden. This is uh, organized together with um, Philippe Sanso from GSK, who will speak later on, and Jakob Köhler from Dal AgroScience. And 